Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is James McIntosh. I'm Chief Toxicologist with Safe Food, and you're all very welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I'm delighted to have with me here my colleague, uh, Dr. Pat O'Mahony. He's the chap on the left. Pat is Chief Specialist in Food Science and Technology uh, at the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. Pat has uh, his background. He's got a BSc in microbiology, an MSc in biotechnology, and a PhD in plant molecular biology, so a scientific heavy hitter, if ever there was one. Pat has a very broad remit that includes risk assessment and risk management of food allergens, and that includes uh, allergen labeling requirements. In this context, he developed the FSAI guidance on allergen information for non-prepacked foods uh, to coincide with measures brought in by the government back in December 2015 as part of the uh, overall introduction of the Food Information for Consumers Regulation 1169 uh, 11 of 2011. Um, I i going to pass straight over to Pat, because Pat's the main show in town today. Uh, and Pat, maybe you'd say something about the overall theme of this webinar. Okay, thanks, James. Um, and welcome to everybody. Hopefully, this uh, webinar will be of some use to qualify or clarify some of the questions you may have in the background. Uh, what I, The first few slides I'm going to talk about are actually what I'm not going to talk about. In other words, we're not going to talk about FIC or the Food Information for Consumers legislation from which this allergen labeling uh, system came about in the first place. Uh, that's already in place for many years now, uh, so we don't need to talk about it. We're also not going to talk about pre-packed food because that's been in place for a while and it's fairly black and white. In other words, where you have a list of ingredients, you have to list your uh, allergenic ingredients uh, in a highlighted manner, whether it be bold or italicized or whatever. So we won't be dealing with that. Uh, so you can forget about prepacked foods for now. It's going to be non-prepacked foods. Another issue we won't be dealing with, and it's not that it's not an issue, uh, it's just that it's not for today's webinar, is that of cross-contamination. And uh, in particular, when you deal with uh, restaurants or hotels or pubs or Catering establishments, uh, cross-contamination is pretty much uh, inevitable as such, uh, and there's there are ways of dealing with it, uh, HACCP and food safety plans, etc. But it's not again for today's webinar. We're going to talk today about non-prepacked foods, and I suppose when you talk about non-prepacked foods, uh, sometimes it's called loose foods. Uh, so it's obviously anything that's not prepacked. But what it also is is, is if you go into a a petrol forecourt and you look for a, or ask for a sandwich and they they wrap it for you there and then uh, that's still called non-prepacked or loose food um, now the very basis of this legislation states that you will put in writing the allergen information that's already required for prepackaged foods or prepacked foods and this is a logical extension of what's been there for prepacked foods already <clears throat> so you have to put the information available or make the information available at the point of presentation or the point of sale or the point of supply. In other words, before you buy the food. Uh, you, can you can present it verbally in addition to the written format, but it has to be presented in the written format. And we'll discuss how and when and where uh, that can be done as we go along. We have some experience, as James said, uh, this National legislation has been in place since uh, the 13th of December 2014, so we have some experience of what's gone on already. Uh, and while there is some uptake of this at national level, there it wouldn't be the most satisfactory, shall we say, uptake of legislation uh, we've seen so far. And there are problems, you know, we understand that. And so this is why this webinar and other training mechanisms are being rolled out to, to help food businesses to understand what exactly is required of them. Here are some of the shall we say, declarations that we see in, in different establishments around the country and which on their own are not compliant. Uh, they, they may be okay in addition to the correct declarations, but not on their own. For example, number one, if you have any questions on food allergies, please ask a staff member. That's not good enough. 
Uh, Pat, can I, yes. can I just uh, interject there? Uh, I think it's worth worth emphasising though that best practice advice to anybody who has a food allergy or food intolerance to celiac disease, for instance, uh, is still always to engage with the staff uh, so that they can get all the information they need to, they need to make an informed choice. Um, and while the legislation, I mean, you're quite right, the legislation um, um, emphasises that to say, if you have any question, please ask a member of staff. That's simply not enough. Uh, nonetheless, um, anybody who has a food hypersensitivity and needs to avoid food for health reasons will engage with the staff uh, in order to get as much information they can from them. Um, and you mentioned already, for instance, that the uh, this webinar wasn't about cross contamination, but still, that is a very important issue, obviously, for um, for customers who have a food hypersensitivity. Yes, what you're saying there, uh, James, makes total sense, and I, I do believe that all mo or uh, most people, at least, with an allergy or an intolerance, will actually engage with the the servers or even the chefs if they if they have a severe uh, intolerance or allergy. So yes, we're talking about a legislative requirement here. Uh, anything in addition to that is is a, a bonus or a plus. The second thing that we see on a regular basis is a bit of a sweeping statement to say that we use all of the following allergens in this restaurant. Again, that's a fine statement and it's all well and good, but under the legislation, you still have to declare whatever allergens are used in a particular menu item or in a particular uh, food. All of our foods may contain the following allergens, which is similar to the last one. Again, on its own, that's not sufficient. And the very last one, uh, people might think this is a joke, but uh, it has been seen, and it's totally permissible. There's nothing wrong with it uh, from a food labeling point of view. There might be other societal issues with it, but this restaurant does not cater for people with food allergies or intolerances. Perfectly fine. Uh, you might have other problems other than food law, but you still have to declare your allergens in your menu items or in your food items. So even those kind of statements do not get you off the hook as such. I, I suppose, Pat, just on, on that last one, um, you know, given that a conservative estimate of the the prevalence of food hypersensitivity in the overall population is anything from 10 to 15 percent, uh, it actually doesn't make even business sense for any restaurant or other eatery to, to refuse to have a blanket refusal of service to to anybody who has a food hypersensitivity. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure it's it's it will be seen very often, and I'm sure it was probably uh, a trick that somebody dreamt up uh, to get away with the, this legislation. But uh, it it doesn't work as such, and we don't see it that often, uh, which is a good, a positive thing. So the next slide I have up here is just the issues that came out at the very start of this, uh, almost three years ago now, when we looked at all the different types of premises and food businesses that would deal with loose foods, uh, some of them are straightforward enough. Restaurants, takeaways, pubs, hotels, etc. Others are not so straightforward. <clears throat> and if you look on the right hand side of the slide, you'll see an airplane, a train, a boat, uh, and on the continent of Europe in particular, any of these forms of travel can go through many different countries uh, in a day. And the question, the obvious question is, well, which labeling uh, requirement do we adhere to and it's it's a salient question for Ireland as well because we have a lot of flights going out of here on a daily basis a lot of ferries going so the, some of these questions are still being discussed at European level um, I think at the moment it would be logical to say that wherever the the flight or the train or the boat starts would be the uh, the legislation require the labeling requirements that would be most pertinent to that food that's not set in stone. That hasn't really been discussed yet, but uh, that's one issue that has been, that is on the on the discussion table. Other ones I will deal with, such as hospitals, care homes, prisons, etc. And these are all issues that have been discussed in the last three years. One thing at the very bottom of that slide, and I'll mention suppliers a few times. You need all food businesses need to be aware of what their suppliers are giving them. <clears throat> it's no use to say I didn't know that allergen was in there. Uh, my supplier didn't tell me. If you're the food business providing food to the ultimate customer, consumer, then you're responsible for the safety of that food. Pat, Pat can I just ask you just to go back there to the, um, the the different forms of transport? I mean, you said that that's uh, out for discussion at the moment as to, you know, is it, is it the, the point of origin, uh, you know, of the, the boat or the plane uh, that is the overarching uh, re regulatory requirement? But 
I mean, the FIC has some, you know, basic level requirements that are right across the European Union. So that, I mean, they, they must keep, uh, um, uh, they must know the ingredients, the, allergen the allergenic ingredients of the foods that they serve. Isn't that right? Whether it is a ship or a, or a plane, if any of those are on that, the list of 14 uh, allergenic ingredients from the, the legislation. Yes, uh, I suppose the difficulty arises uh, in that FICT legislation left it up to member states how exactly they wanted to provide allergen information on loose foods. So in Ireland, uh, the government decided to make it in a written format. Uh, I think in the UK and many other EU member states, uh, they left it at verbal. Um, so there are different systems in play across Europe. So you could actually uh, traverse different jurisdictions and have different systems in play and that's where the difficulty arises. Uh, technically it hasn't uh, arisen as a real problem as such and uh, we know that food people, are, sorry, that people with food allergies and intolerances will ask anyway if they're anyway unsure and this will be sorted out in time to come. It's just, uh, it's just at that discussion level yet in Brussels. Also, what about the voluntary provision of food for, for instance, a charity or f like a fundraising uh, event? The voluntary provision of food, is, is, is that covered under this legislation as well? Or? I suppose a lot of the questions we've been asked uh, in the last couple of years had a simple answer. If you're a food business, then you're, you're obliged to provide this information in a written format in Ireland. If you're not a food business, and that can uh, incorporate some voluntary uh, provision of food, let's say at uh, church fates or fairs and that kind of stuff, where it's not a business as such, then you're not obliged to uh, follow the, the labelling legislation. So these are all questions that we've been asked and I'm sure there will be similar ones asked but when you say voluntary, you can still be voluntary but be associated with a food business and therefore subject to this labelling legislation. You could be voluntary, for example, providing sandwiches for uh, under 16 football training of a Thursday night. That's just uh, an individual providing food for uh, youngsters and that's that would not be considered a food business so a lot of these are case it's, by it's case it's not a commercial it's not a commercial transaction not a commercial that last example would be, would be, yeah, would be one yeah, of those, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah okay uh, an important aspect more and more in our daily lives is distance selling uh, so you're talking pizzas takeaways uh, and all kinds of establishments that provide food <clears throat> sometimes without the final customer ever darkening the doors where they do it all online or you get the pizza menu in the door and you ring up, etc. The food labeling requirement for uh, written allergen labeling uh, applies to those as well. Now, there is a bit of a quirk in the, the system for distance selling uh, in that the actual requirement applies before the, uh, the food is purchased, but also after or at the moment of delivery. Now, the good thing is that at the moment of delivery, it can be verbal. Uh, as long as the written information has been provided beforehand. So let's say uh, online or in menus that have been dropped in the door or something like that. If it hasn't been provided in written format before delivery, then it has to be provided in written format by the delivery person at the point of delivery. And that's an important thing to remember. Pat, can I just ask, uh, in a lot of cases, you have a se almost a separate delivery company delivering the food from its point of um, production? to the end customer how does that who's responsible there for the provision of of the information yeah what we see in recent years is uh, two different yeah, like systems. A pizza delivery company for instance or something yeah you know. well with the pizza delivery company it's their food it's their delivery if, if it is their delivery and it's just it's totally up to them but there are other companies out there there's two different uh, systems have arisen in the last number of years there are companies who do nothing but deliver food and they are a food business, so they would be responsible for providing the information, either the written information at the moment of delivery or it verbally at the moment of delivery. There are other companies that do just an online presence, and all they do is advertise food, but they do not handle food in any way. Uh, they are not food businesses as, as, as of today, and that might change down the road, but as of now, they're not food businesses. So the actual allergen information is the requirement of the food business providing the food, not the, um, <clears throat> the advertising agency. Now, I did mention specialized situations, uh, not just the, the air travel and the boat travel, etc. There are situations where it's not black and white, and we have discussed these over the last three years, and we have a, a reasonably good handle on them as such. So let's say a childcare facility, a creche, where you're, you're talking about from babies up to 
three or four years of age and obviously delivering a menu to the to the child in question is not going to get much satisfaction so in such cases the written information has to be provided by the creche but it's not necessarily has to be shoved in the face of a child all day every day but the carers uh, in the facility are the guardians uh, the parents or guardians whoever they are once they're aware of the menu items and the allergens in those menu items that would be sufficient it still has to be provided there in written format detention facilities uh, and we're talking prisons and maybe guard stations uh, if they are considered food businesses then they fall under this legislation now even prisons will have uh, what you could call restaurants but they're not really their uh, dining halls or dining facilities they would be required to have the written information as as for a normal restaurant now if you have some inmate who's not allowed out of his cell or her cell uh, for long periods they still require to be provided the written information uh, it doesn't have to be every day if the menu doesn't change um, it can be i suppose a pragmatic situation as such and then you have charitable organizations let's say soup runs meals on wheels etc they too would have to have their written information as long as they're considered food businesses now again uh, do you need to shove a, a menu in the face of, of people getting this food every day and, and the answer there would be no once they're aware of the menu items and they're aware of the allergen information which would have been provided at some stage to them in written format then that's sufficient so so pat i mean i think it's important to emphasize there that <clears throat> it's not just uh where there's a commercial transaction of food for instance in a detention facility or a charitable organization there isn't a commercial transaction the end user is not buying the food off the provider but you must still provide the allergen information um as if it were a commercial transaction isn't that right yes i think commercial transaction isn't the be all and all if you're a food yeah. business then you are subject to this legislation uh, the commercial transaction most people involved in commercial transactions with food would be food businesses anyway but there are examples where there is no commercial transaction but they still would be food businesses and charitable organizations uh, would fall under that category and i'd say with meals on wheels for instance and meals on wheels would be the same yes <clears throat> there's no money changes hand there again with hospitals and care homes uh, similar to child care facilities if it's a general hospital and they have a restaurant uh, or even if uh, patients can't make it to the restaurant and they're fully compass mentis then uh, written allergen information is required obviously where uh, a patient is mentally incapacitated or has maybe dementia in a care home or something like that and they're not able to process the written allergen information then it's up to the the carers on on the facility or the guardians or parents or whatever of those people to make sure that they're aware of the allergen information in those menus and that it's available to them whenever the menu uh, will change one uh, thing to be aware of here is that if you are visiting some of these areas and you are kindly offered a, a tea or, or a sandwich or something just to be aware for the hospital's sake that uh, they need to cover themselves um, and have that written allergen information available even for visitors if they're just there on a, on a short-term basis uh, and this would be more to cover cover themselves if, if there was a mishap <clears throat> now contract caterers is a, is a huge area and there's a lot of work going on in this section so um, I'll try and cover this in, a, in as brief a fashion as I can so if you're getting uh, sandwiches in for a meeting uh, the, the people who provide in the sandwiches need to provide written allergen information let's say on chicken sandwich contains X Y and Z beef sandwich contains X Y and Z uh, and so on and they need to provide that to the purchaser which may be a company or an individual what that individual or company does with that information afterwards is up to themselves uh, they, you know ideally they should pass it on to the people who will be consuming those sandwiches uh, because if they don't then if there is a mishap later on <clears throat> there could be an issue if for example you have a plate of biscuits and there are many different biscuits or the same for cakes uh, it wouldn't be practical to have a, a, an allergen menu item for each biscuit so you would have say contains all the ingredients uh, the allergenic ingredients in those biscuits on that plate or in those cakes and there's a special situation that may arise for functions where let's say a wedding uh, and a wedding cake is provided now if you booked your wedding in a hotel <coughs> and the hotel provides all the food including the wedding cake then the, the the hotel 
is ultimately responsible for all the allergen information being in a written form. If, however, as does happen quite a lot, the wedding cake is made by a member of a family or a friend who is not a food business, then the situation may arise where the hotel would need to step in because the allergen information would possibly be required um, so to uh, safeguard the hotel in that situation. Again, would, the hotel, sorry, Pat, would the hotel be liable because that wedding cake would would be provided to its customers, more or less, at that wedding on its premises? This would be the risk, um, and this yeah. is where the, the hotel needs to be sure of what they're doing. If the person making the cake is not a food business, then they're not required to provide this allergen information. But still, the, the cake will more likely be consumed on the hotel premises. Exactly. So whatever cases may be taken thereafter would be up to uh, the individual that may have a, a, an adverse reaction. Uh, and so the hotel would need to be cognizant of that fact. If the wedding cake was bought in, I suppose, that then that solves that problem. Because obviously, if it's bought from a commercial, um, a commercial operator, then they'll have to provide the allergen information to the hotel for serving that cake on its premises. Isn't that right? Well, it depends. If the hotel buys it, uh, then the hotel would ideally put that information available for the people who will consume it. If it's the uh -huh. bride or groom or the family or the bride or groom who buys it, ideally they should provide that information for those people consuming it again. If they yeah. don't, uh, then and if there's a problem, then it probably will come down to a, a lawsuit and uh, it's difficult to know who would win in that situation. Yeah. Okay, so some, uh, I suppose, straightforward tips. When you're talking about loose food or non-prepacked foods and there's no list of ingredients, technically you're required to put the word contains before it. So contains peanuts, contains soya, contains milk, etc. If you do put a voluntary list of ingredients on a food, and sometimes you'll see in uh, petrol forecourts that they do actually put a list of, uh, let's say, chicken sandwich with something else in there, you have to follow the FIC rules in those cases, even though it's a, a list of ingredients is not required. So just be aware that if you do voluntarily put a, a list of ingredients on a food that doesn't require it, you, you will have to follow the FIC rules in that case. It has to be in English or in English and Irish. This is Ireland, so we are English and Irish are the main languages spoken. If, if somebody wishes to put it in Polish or Dutch or French, uh, in addition to those languages, that's well and good, but it has to be at least in English or in English and Irish. It can be in many places. It can be uh, for a restaurant, you can have it in one single place, or you can have it in all the menu items, and we'll show examples later on. It has to be conspicuous. In other words, some place that I can go into a restaurant or a, a hotel or a pub, and I can get up and go and look at it myself. It can't be hidden in a drawer behind the counter somewhere. It can't be somewhere I can't access it. It has to be clear and identify food items that, that have allergens. So you can't make a broad sweeping statement to say all of our food contains or is likely to contain wheat or that, that kind of stuff. And it has to identify the actual food that has the actual allergen. And of course, you can't make a general sweeping claim that, it, that, that a product contains an allergen if it doesn't. Uh, that's, that's as bad as not putting anything on there. So, so that rules out the the earlier example you gave, where somebody listed um, all of our products can can, take, can contain the following allergens, and they listed the whole fourteen. Well, allergens. when you say when you say can contain, that's more like a precautionary label. But if you say yeah. all our products contain uh, okay. wheat, yeah. and they don't, then that's a misleading statement under general thick rules. Yeah, because some of them don't. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. So a, a, an example, and these are only examples, and there are many ways to put the written allergen information in a restaurant, for example, and these are just some examples we've put together. So your average menu, you can either put it straight on the menu or have it in a legend form, numerically or alphabetically linked. You can put it in a central folder or on a page somewhere on the restaurant that can be easily accessed, and you can advertise that location and its presence either on the poles uh, or those standing columns, as I've uh, shown there on the, um, the slide, or you can have it advertised on the menu. Any way you like, as long as people can say, all right, I need to go and check the allergies on here, and they can do it without assistance. At either or. I mean, you, 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 if you have them advertised on the, on the menu, then you don't have to advertise it in a, a conspicuous a checkout area or anything. Yes. Yeah, you don't have to have it uh, in every different format. Okay. One, one format that can be accessed by the person is is plenty. And perhaps, you know, some, some, in, in hotels, for instance, you, you, you have a lot of menus and bedrooms. Um, 
it, it does, do the same rules apply there, or yes. how, how would you work around that? I mean, if if if, if, the, if the allergens are list, listed in the menu, well and good, but if they're not? Yeah, so if you're in your hotel room and uh, it says the allergen uh, list is at the bar counter, uh, then you have to go and look at the allergen list at the bar counter. Now, if, if you're unable to or whatever, and the hotel uh, can oblige, then they can bring you that list. But once it's freely available and it's advertised where it's freely available, uh, then you have to go down from your room and, and look at that allergen list, unless you can organize with the hotel themselves. Another thing we always remind uh, food businesses is that if you do specials, and a lot of places do these, uh, you need to put the allergen information on those just as well. Now, if you can write the allergen, or sorry, if you can write the menu on a, on a chalkboard or whatever it be, then it takes a few seconds to add the allergens in there as well. So it's not a real uh, chore as such. If you have a buffet-style meal, then uh, again, the allergen information has to be provided there. Now, there is a few different ways of doing that. You can put some kind of advertisements at the individual platters, or you can have a central folder to say, you know, what the allergens or what foods contain what allergens, straightforward enough. A lot of people forget uh, beverages, beer, cider, wine, uh, they all contain some form of allergens, and that has to be um, provided in written format as well. We've often had the, uh, the statement by pubs, but sure, we don't do food. Well, in fact, they do, and they have to provide the written allergen information the same as a restaurant or a hotel, etc. And what happens in the case of cocktails? You, you mentioned there are cocktails. I mean, if somebody in offerance is making, I don't know, like a like a white wine spritzer, if there's some SO2 in the white wine, but you're diluting it, you know, in a, in a mix, maybe a 50-50 mix with lemonade or something. How does that do? You, do you have okay. to take that into account? Or? Uh, you, you may or may not, depending on the situation. So if you have such a, a white wine and a spritzer mixed together and it's on your menu, then the allergen information, sulfites in that case, would have to be mentioned. If you walk in off the street and say, I would like some uh, wine added to some spritzer uh, and it's not on your menu list, then that doesn't uh, apply because it's not one of your items. It's the same as uh, asking for a, a fairly highfalutin cocktail to be mixed with five or six drinks uh, and then expecting to have that in written format is not pragmatic as such. So no, there's two different situations there. Now, something that's very important, uh, you might think you've got your whole system covered and then you forget about condiments, dressings, stocks, etc. Uh, they're small foods, so they tend to pass under the radar sometimes, but they are equally important and they can cause severe problems uh, to people who are uh, allergic or intolerant to food. So always keep an eye on all of your menu items and your dressings uh, and toppings, etc. Now, there are some ex exemptions as such uh, and this is at an EU level. For example, you have fish pie on the menu. <clears throat> well, you don't need to say contains fish because that would make it look a bit silly. Having said that, if there is fish and soya and eggs and milk and a few others in the fish pie, then you need to mention the eggs and milk and uh, whatever not. In that case, we would advise that you add the, the, the fish as well as all the other allergens so that people aren't confused. So your fish pie, oh. You, could, yeah. you would then say it contains fish and egg and milk, etc. So like pr prawn cocktail, for instance, you, you, you would say it contains egg and sesame mustard and crustaceans as well. You, yes. you, you, would, you would specify crustaceans. Yeah, yes, right. and, and the fear there is that when you leave crustaceans out, they might say, oh, well, that might be just the name of the product. There might be no crustaceans in there. So when there's other allergens in there, uh, make sure you include the whole lot just for your own sake, for safety's sake. Now, there are a number of other... Um, clarifications shall we say uh, and they're on a website uh, I suppose the one thing I must remember if in doubt name it you can't go wrong if you name it uh, and, and you're doing it in, in, in good faith there is a website uh, the FSAI has a list of clarifications that have been discussed at EU level so you can always go on there and see what other clarifications for example butter you don't have to say contains milk and, and a few others so you can simply go on that website there and that will bring you straight into the document other things to remember when you're um, declaring your allergens in written format, it has to be the wheat or the oats or the barley, etc., not gluten, that you list in writing. Now, you can put in gluten there in addition, but the main requirement is contains wheat, contains oat, oats, etc. You can't just have gluten in there and nothing else. That doesn't work. 
Certain products will actually contain or have added um, a cereal <clears throat> that contains gluten, but can actually be labeled as gluten-free. And the obvious example there would be oats that has been grown from scratch. Now, it would still have to be highlighted in a pre-packed food where it's used as, a, uh, as an ingredient. But when you're talking about uh, where there's no list of ingredients, you could actually put gluten-free in such a type of food. Most wines we've uh, discovered have sulfites. So even if you do find a wine that you're not sure whether it has sulfites or not, I think the general um, wisdom is that most wines do contain sulfites. And therefore, that is labeled on the bottle anyway. But if you're handing out uh, wine by the glass at a table, then your menu should have that um, listed as well. Again, I mentioned in the suppliers here because it is all too important. Uh, if there is somebody on, on a food business premises that gets sick, uh, you can't blame your supplier. The person handing out the food to the ultimate consumer is the person responsible for that food. So you need to be very sure of your suppliers and what they're providing you. And precautionary allergen labeling is not a declaration. And we'll talk about precautionary allergen labeling um, in a while now. So precautionary allergen labeling is an, a voluntary label that a lot of food businesses put on their foods. And in some cases, it's justified, and in some cases, it's not. We have evidence in the past, and it's not just Ireland, but the UK and North America and other countries in Europe, where they have found food businesses putting these precautionary allergen labels, such as may contain or produced in a factory that also produces. And they've used these as a, a, a catch-all to protect themselves from any potential legal um, impact. The problem with those labels, and this has been uh, demonstrated very clearly as well, is that people with allergies um, or intolerances get immune to them. And they'll either take a chance and then get seriously injured, or else they will just cut that food out of an already restricted diet. When used judiciously, they're very useful. Because if you have a factory line that's producing uh, two different products at the same time, and there's peanuts in one and not on the other, then there's a good chance there will be some aerosolized uh, peanut get onto the non-peanut product, and that would be a, a justifiable use of such labels. But in general, they're not justified, is what we've been talking about. Pat, on, the, on that basis, I mean, that last example that you gave there, I mean, if, for instance, a, a restaurant was using a, a peanut-based product that was produced in a, or, or any product, a non-peanut-based product that was produced in a factory where peanuts were also used in other products, and it contained, you know, the statement may contain peanut, should they then pass that information on to their customers, even though in whatever meal uh, they make up, there is no peanut as a deliberate ingredient? Should they pass on the PAL to their customers? Yeah, this is a, a tough question to answer, and it's not one I would <clears throat> answer too lightly, because the, the food business is trying to do the best by their consumers. They've received information from their supplier that there may be a content of a certain allergen. Do I or don't I? Obviously, if you're trying to be safe, you will pass that on. What we're trying to do as regulators is to stamp out the, the non-essential use of that label. And in fact, at uh, European level, there have been discussions about limiting the statements to one or two types of statements and requiring a risk assessment to be taken before such statements are passed on. So that's a couple of years off yet. But down the road, uh, where the regulators will find precautionary allergen labels, they will ask the food business for justification and uh, evidence of a risk assessment. Now, the risk assessment could mean going back to your supplier and say, why have you put this on there? You could, as a, as a business, as a client, you could ask them for a similar risk assessment so that you're uh, a lot more sure of what information you're getting. So it, it's a difficult question to answer. Obviously, the safe thing to do would be to pass it on, but you're not exactly doing a favor to those people with allergies and intolerances when you do that. No, you're, you're quite right, and all the evidence suggests that precautionary allergen labelling is a bit of a nightmare at the moment. But, I mean, for the point of view of the, the end user, the, 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 the customer, I mean, if you, for instance, had somebody um, out for a meal in a restaurant who had a, an egg allergy and, you know, a serious egg, egg allergy, uh, you know, they, they must engage with the staff to get all the information they require, and they may well want to know uh, if any of the ingredients had uh, a precautionary allergen labelling statement on the on the packet so just to bear that in mind yes and in, in your average kitchen i mean they're not aseptic environments so there will be 
the likes of uh, wheat flour and other um, ingredients growing around the place are getting con uh, uh, being contaminants in other foods that they shouldn't be in, and we we understand that's uh, <clears throat> that's normal business. Um, so it, it's a tough situation, and when you're faced with it, uh, you have to make a decision there and then. And obviously, uh, you might be inclined to just pass them on uh, regardless, but that that will change down the road. So I'm going to move on to. Um, Gluten-free labeling. Now, gluten-free labels are not allergen declarations per se. This is a voluntary type of declaration that's been used for many years, uh, and it was regulated under Parnuts uh, up to the FIC legislation, and now it falls under FIC. So quite simply, <clears throat> if you have a food that, can, that contains no gluten or gluten under 20 milligrams per kilogram or 20 parts per million, then you can put gluten-free on there. And there are some caveats which I'll discuss later. If you have a food that contains wheat or that has been there were wheat, barley, oats or one of those gluten containing ingredients and if you have uh, done some work to reduce the gluten in there then you can use the term very low gluten. Now the legislation outlined above 828 of 2014 is very strict and very straightforward. If you want to say anything about the absence or reduced presence of gluten in a food, you shall only use the actual terms or phrases in that legislation. So it's either gluten-free or very low gluten. In addition to those, let's say gluten-free, you can also say suitable for people intolerant to gluten or suitable for celiacs. Or where you want to use very low gluten, you can also say specifically formulated for people intolerant to gluten or specifically formulated for celiacs. That's the end. Ask, can, yes. Can I just ask you there? I mean, so the term gluten free is now specifically defined in law as meaning less than or equal to 20 parts per million, 20 milligrams of gluten per kilogram of the food, whatever it is, a meal or a bar or whatever, or a sandwich, whatever. Um, there's no scope there for using the term gluten-free, if you like, qualitatively. I'm just thinking of a restaurant situation. They're not going to know the actual level. They, have, they can't do a test on a meal. Do you know what I mean? And um, can, they, can, can uh, a caterer still use the term gluten-free qualitatively? I mean, if they know that none of the ingredients contain gluten, and they, you know, they know how they're the bona fide operator and they control gluten in their premises, uh, can they use that term qualitatively? For a restauranter or a, a hotelier or whatever to use gluten-free, they would want to be very sure that the product they have put together for a, a customer has less than 20 milligrams per kilo of gluten in there. That is doable, of course, uh, but as I mentioned a while ago, kitchens are not aseptic environments, so there is a lot of work going on at the same time, so the chances of stopping all contamination uh, is, is low, but it is possible. And if you're sure that your product, uh, your, your menu item contains no yeah. gluten, then I think gluten-free is, is fine. The risk is that somehow by cross-contamination, somebody gets sick. And then when the food is checked, it's found to have more than the 20 ppm, then <clears throat> that is a risk. Uh, but yes, the, the restauranter can, can use the gluten-free tag. Now, in the legislation 828-2014, it does say in the recitals that people with food that is naturally gluten-free should be able to express that. And uh, that is mentioned in black and white in that legislation. However, it's also mentioned in the same voice almost that you have to be cognizant of the thick regulation in that you cannot mislead the consumer. So on the bottom of this slide here, I have eggs and I have milk, and there's many other different examples I could use. You can't say eggs are gluten-free because all eggs are gluten-free. You couldn't say your milk is gluten-free because milk is specifically defined in legislation and can only be milk. Now, having said that, if you have a composite or a processed food that has many ingredients, and if there is a chance that one of the ingredients could have been but is not a uh, gluten-containing cereal, then you could say gluten-free. That would be understandable. Uh, and a lot of this is left up to your common sense. But um, if you use it on simple products like eggs or milk uh, or primary products like beef uh, to say gluten-free, then that's, that certainly wouldn't be allowed as such. 
So, Pat, for instance, if a, if a chef used a, a vegetable stir-fry mix, for instance, that contained nothing but chopped up vegetables, he, he, they can't say then that that's, you know, the meal that the results from that was gluten-free. Yes. If there is such a thing that would have no uh, other ingredients in there that couldn't be of, uh, that couldn't have any gluten-containing cereals, then you couldn't use that gluten-free tag. That's great. And there's one more, one more question, Pat, with regard to gluten. There's a phrase, non-gluten-containing ingredients. Is that now, that was, that's, uh, it, it used to be used to describe, um, like we'll say, groups of products or, or meals and a menu that uh, didn't have any gluten-containing ingredients. Is, is that still allowed? No, no, that's the, the legislation is quite clear. If you're going to talk or mention or indicate or suggest about the absence or low-level presence of gluten, the only phrases you can use are the ones uh, we talked about in the earlier slides. Yeah, because uh, I think there's a distinction there between the the Republic of Ireland and the UK. I think it it's still allowed to a certain degree in the, in the United Kingdom to describe groups of dishes on a menu. Um, if if they do, if the if the caterer doesn't want to use the term gluten free, they can use they can describe a group of of, of dishes as non gluten containing ingredients or having non gluten containing ingredients. Yeah, I'm aware of that uh, variance with the UK, all right, and I'm not sure how it, it happens, but uh, I think the legislation is fairly clear uh, that these are the only phrases or terms you can use for gluten free. So I think we'll leave it at that. Uh, we have a lot of guidance on our website, on the Food Safety Authority website, um, on gluten-free and on allergens in general. And there's also the Safe Food Allergen Resources that we, we know of. We have also put together um, an allergen checklist that um, people are finding useful in, in food businesses where they can list their menu items on the left and then check off individually. And that's 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 simply all you need, really, um, if you want to put that information then in a folder or even up on a, a pillar or somewhere that anybody can access it whenever they want. And it's you know clearly visible to, to know which menu item contains which allergen, uh, that kind. But as I said before, there are many ways to do this. Uh, so we wouldn't say that these are the only ways of doing it. OK. Thanks very much for that, Pat. That was great. Um, I'm going to hand uh, uh, things the control over now to Tracy, and uh, she's going to invite uh, you, ladies and gentlemen, to submit any questions you may have following this presentation.